I think you guys have already heard all of this, but just just so you know, the exam tomorrow, you have no time limit. I bring a bunch of extra stuff to goof around with up here. Uh, there's probably like a soccer game or something I can watch. Um, you know, but you should assume that I'm working hard up here. Uh, you know, so honestly, like if you if you have to take extra time to do whatever, I don't care, do it. Um, you get a three by five card of notes. You can put formulas, right? <laughs> yeah, anything you want. Um, not anything you want. Don't put like worked examples. Like I don't want to see exact numbers. Like this should never be on your note card because that's full of numbers and exact things, right? It should just be the formulas. Um, and things like that. Um, I would recommend you should probably write down like all the um, all the formulas for the applications, right? And so like the work principle, one over a plus one over b equals one over t. You know the motion d equals r t. You want to know that. Um, what else? Consecutive numbers. Right? You, know, you want to remember that if you have a consecutive numbers problem, you name the first number n or x, and the next one n or x plus 1, things like that. So let's go ahead and get started here. So this one should be the first problem in packet number 1. <clears throat> and this one asks us to factor completely. So to factor completely on this one, I need to find a common factor in each and every one of these terms and pull it out front, and then see if I can factor any more after that. So each of these coefficients is even. The smallest is 2, so I can definitely pull at least a 2 out. I noticed that. Um, let's see now. There's an x contained in each of these terms, so I can definitely pull an x out. And there's at least one y in each of these terms. Right? And so if I wanted to completely show my work on this, whoops, maybe I'll write it down here, um, I would say 2xy, I'd factor that out, and then remaining, I would have a y squared here, plus 2xy times the remaining 2y, and then, whoops, Oops, not a plus. Um, let's see now, how would you do this one? So you'd say plus a negative 2xy, and that's just multiplied by our 3 back here. All right, and so to show my work on that one, all I did was split up all each and every term. You can see I identified the factor that's common, and I just wrote it out in front of the rest. So now in this next step, I write it all the way out front. 2xy, and then I fill in my parentheses with whatever's left. y squared plus 2y minus 3. Oops. Careful, I did not factor this negative out, so it stays there. No. Oh, uh, yeah. Since we're past that, like you know, we've been past that on on homework. Now you don't necessarily need to show this middle part. Um, yeah, with the factoring, it's it's pretty. You can do factoring in your head, so you don't need to show that middle part. You really don't want to. Um, <clears throat> but there's one more step remaining, right? After we factor a common term out of everything, sometimes we're done. Sometimes we're not. So we have to take a look at this extra polynomial and see if we can factor that. And yeah, I think we can, but we'll find out. So I continue to write 2xy out front, and now I need to factor this guy. So I write out my factorization, like I know it looks like. Right? I don't have a coefficient. My only coefficient is a 1 up here. So this breaks into y times y right here. So now <clears throat> I am looking for two numbers. And I'm going to kind of, inter well, <laughs> maybe it's a little late to introduce this, but if, you ha if you're having trouble kind of keeping track of those two numbers in your head, you can label them P and Q, right? This is something that I used to do when I was in algebra. And I'd say, okay, I am now looking for two numbers, P, whoops, that's backwards, <laughs> P and Q. Oh, this one right here? 
Oh. Good question, though. Yeah, because we had six up here, right? We split off a two and a three. Um, so now we're looking for P and Q, right? We can label these P and Q for now. We're looking for P and Q such that P times Q is equal to our final number, right? Our last constant term, negative three. And also such that P plus Q is equal to our middle term, right? Which is a plus two. Okay, so if, if, if you don't like writing out that P and Q part, you absolutely don't have to. Um, but, but for some of us, it helps us to kind of keep those numbers in our head. I like to write it out personally. Okay, so I'm looking for those two numbers, right? I'm going to go in here and erase these. I'm going to create my little table. And you don't have to create a table. Remember, I'm just doing this because, because. <laughs> There you go. So on this side, if this weren't such an easy example, I would write <laughs> pairwise factors of negative 3 and then sums on this side. And I'd say in a little parentheses, I want a sum of 2. <clears throat> All right, so we'd be looking for pairwise factors of negative 3 that when we combine them, they equal 2. OK, well, to get negative 3, the only way we can do that is multiply 1 and, oops, 1 and 3. All right? If we want a positive 2, then this isn't going to work if we put the negative on the 3. Right? So we're going to have to put the negative on the 1. So 3 minus 1, that is equal to positive 2. So we say yes. We've found two numbers. These numbers, when multiplied together, they give us negative 3. When added or combined, they give us 2. So we've found the numbers. All we need to do is plug them into our factorization. The numbers are negative 1, positive 3. Okay, that would be it. We can't factor any more, so we're done. Okay. Let's move on to number two. <laughs> this one's similar. Uh, so for this one, remember, once again, this is a factorization problem. right? We notice there's no coefficient, so we don't need to do the whole factor by grouping thing. Since there's no coefficient, we know that it breaks up into these two simple binomials. We take a look at our last term. We say that's a plus 5. right? Our middle term is a plus 6. So on here, on the side, we can say we are looking for two numbers, P and Q, such that P times Q is equal to 5, and P plus Q is equal to 6. I just made them up. You can change them if you like. You could change them to A and B if you wanted to. Um, I don't know why I used P and Q. Maybe I should change it to smiley face. Yeah. <laughs> Pie smiley. <Yeah. laughs> All right. So, so now that I've found, you know, I can make a table for this, but since 5 is prime, we really don't need to, right? Uh, 5 is equal to 1 times 5. 1 times 5 is equal to 6. So P and Q equals 1 and 5. So I'm going to say plus 1 plus 5. Right. If I want to test, if I want to test this out and make sure it's correct, which you know, you might want to do that just because this is going to be worth a lot on your exam and you don't want to mess it up. You can foil this back out and make sure that you get the original polynomial. Okay. <clears throat> so next. So this one is an example of not such an easy polynomial to factor. And that's because we have something other than a 1 here in the leading term. We have a 9. So what we're going to do is we're going to factor this by grouping. Um, you could guess and check, right? And in which case, you'd want to guess and check quite a few different examples. But we don't necessarily want to guess and check because nine's not prime. So we're going to do a factor by grouping. So this one's a little bit different because it's got that 9 in front. All right, remember, this is the general form of what we're using. So on the left side of our table, we want a times c. All right, with this particular problem, a is equal to 9, 
c is equal to 2. So we have 18 right here. All right, and then on this other side, I say sums, and I want, I want that middle number 9. All right, so um, I don't know, 18 uh, times 1. Nope, that's not going to work. Um, 9 times 2. Aha! 9 plus 2 is equal to 11. We don't like that. We put a big X through it. But I heard somebody say 3 times 6. Right? And if you're not sure what these numbers are, <laughs> you can brute force this. Right? If, if you know, 18 is a little easier than most, but say you're working with like 72 or something like that, or, or 158, and you're not sure which multiple you want to use, just start plugging it into your calculator and divide it by every integer you can think of, and eventually you're going to hit the right one. So on this one, we have 3 times 6. 3 plus 6, that's equal to 9. So yes, we found our factors. But this is a little bit different than when we have the 1 and the coefficient, right? We're doing this for a slightly different reason. So on this one, the first number drops straight down. And remember, this middle term, 9x, now splits into these two terms, 3 and 6. So I have plus 3x, oops, I forgot my squared here, plus 6x plus 2. And just notice that 3x plus 6x is still just equal to 9x. So I didn't change the value of anything. I just split up two terms. So now I try and factor this by grouping. I draw my little imaginary brackets around the first two terms, and I try and factor out anything that I'm able to. So I have 9 and 3 are both divisible by 3, so I can definitely factor a 3 out. Both terms contain an x, so I'm going to factor that out as well. What I have left is 3x plus 1. Now, with these other two terms, 6x plus 2, I just need to factor out whatever I can. And they're both even numbers. I can factor out a maximum of a 2. And I have 3x plus 1 remaining after that. So now, I recognize that these two factors match, which means I'm allowed to factor by grouping. So I write those out front. 3x plus 1. And then in my second set of parentheses, I just fill it in with whatever remained. 3x plus 2. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> there's, there's certainly going to be a problem like this on the exam. Um, you know, you can either make sure that you're decent at guess and check so that you don't spend too much time on that, or you can go back and try and memorize uh, this this whole process. Okay, onwards to number four. So in this one, I'm actually asked to solve a polynomial rather than uh, just factor. And remember, when we're asked to solve a polynomial, first thing is to collect all the terms. Sorry, I should clarify. When we're asked to solve a polynomial that has a squared term, we subtract all those terms over to one side, set it equal to zero, then factor that, and then analyze each factor for what value would make it equal to zero. So first step is to factor this. So to factor this guy, I'm going to draw out my factors. Right, an x and an x, because there's no coefficient out here in front. So this is a simple example. <clears throat> and I do say simple in quotation marks. So I have a negative last term, right? Remember, we need two numbers that multiply to give us this last term. The only way to get a negative is to multiply a negative by a positive. So these signs are positive and negative. All right, and then I take a look at this middle term. That's a plus 1, right? And so I would use that to figure out what my factors are. So over here on my table, I would say factors of the final number, negative 6. And then I'd say sums. And I want a plus 1. Yes, it would absolutely be 3 and 2. Um, before I jump too far into that, though, I might write a little extra just to keep this stuff straight in my head, I would say I'm looking for two numbers, p and q, such that p times q 
was equal to a negative 6, and p plus q was equal to a 1. <clears throat> okay, so now, just like somebody said, we could try, somebody didn't mention this, but I'm going to do it anyway, we could try 1 and 6, right? Um, you can figure out, though, no matter which one of these you put the negative on, you're never going to make a positive 1 out of that. You're either going to make plus or minus 5, right? So that's, that's not really what we wanted. Um, but we did get a mention of 2 times 3. Okay, so we have 2, we have a 3, and then we want a positive 1, right? And so we want to put the negative sign on the smaller term so that we can end up with an overall positive number. So 3 minus 2, yes, that does equal 1. So those are our two factors. So now I have a positive 3, negative 2, and this still equals 0. So now my last step on these ones, I just need to analyze each factor for what value of x would make that whole factor 0. <clears throat> right? And so I look at this first factor and I say, what would I have to plug in to make that equal 0? It's x equals negative 3. Right? And, and try and visualize that, you know, like I, it's a little bit weird the way we're explaining it maybe, but just, just say like, remember, what would I plug in here to give me an overall result of zero, right? Because if that happens, then the whole equation is true and we've solved it. Okay, so we do the same thing with this x minus two. I say, I focus in on this x and I say, what would I plug in there to get an overall result of zero? It would have to be positive two. And so those are the two solutions to this particular equation. <clears throat> um, if you're thinking to yourself, well, I, I'm fairly confident with that, but this is an exam situation, and I don't want to lose points just because I forgot to test something, so I'm going to check my solution on this. I'm going to check um, x equals positive 2. So you plug it back into the original equation. So I have x squared plus x minus 6 equals 0 create my little table, and then I plug in my proposed solution. So I say, what if x were equal to 2? Then I'd have 2 squared here, plus 2, minus 6, equals 0. 2 squared is equal to 4, plus 2, minus 6, equals 0. Then I have 6 minus 6. In the end, I get a true statement. So yeah, this was a solution to this problem. I can do the same thing with negative 3. And if I don't come up with a true statement in the end, if in the end I get like 3 equals 4 or something like that, that wasn't a solution to the problem. It's got to be a true statement at the end. Yeah, so with those ones, it's pretty easy to check your work with those. I would definitely recommend doing that. Okay, moving on to number 5. Oh, this guy's a beauty. <clears throat> um, okay, so this is another one of those evaluation problems. And remember, I just call these ones plug and play. Um, basically, there'll be a description of what this big ugly thing is. In this case, it's, a, it's an example of a function for concentration of a drug in somebody's bloodstream. Um, it, you know, it'll give you some description. It'll identify what the variables are. In this case, it says X is hours. Um, F is the amount in the patient's blood. And then they'll give you a number to plug in for one of those variables. So for this one, they give us a time, X equals 0 0.5. So that's what we're going to do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> with these problems, Probably one of the most common mistakes is just doing the math wrong because the math can be uh, tedious, you know. Uh, so I usually plug everything in and just take it one step at a time. So I have 0 0.5 to the fourth power plus 12 times 0.5 cubed minus 58 times 0.5 squared plus 132, oops, times 0.5. 
Um, so depending on what calculator you have, you can definitely enter all this into one line and just hit enter and get the answer. That tends to be a little bit of a risky um, thing though, because if you make one mistake along the line, you might get the wrong answer. Um, you can do it either way. On, on these, I typically like to punch each term in individually and then write it down on my paper and add them all up in the end. So I have 0.5 raised to the fourth power. That gives me 0 0.0625 plus 12 times 0.5 raised to the third power, 0.125 minus 58 times 0.5 squared, which is 0.25. And then finally, 132 times 0.5, I can just do that right now. That gives me 66. Okay, so on this on the next line, I'll just do a little bit more math on each step. Uh, so I have 0.0625 plus 12 times 0.125. That gives me 1.5 minus 58 times 0.25. That gives me 14.5. And then I still have a plus 66. So now I just add all these up. It's 0 0.0625 plus 1.5 minus 14.5 plus 66. And I don't know if this is what you guys got, but I got 53.0625. I'm assuming that nobody else did it. Otherwise, I'd be getting a head nod or a no way you're wrong, pal. We'll assume that this is correct. <laughs> um, so on, a, on an actual exam situation though, you might want to do this twice just to make sure you didn't mess anything small up, right? Because these problems aren't too bad, like mentally, they're not, it's not a heavy slog to figure this out. It's just a matter of getting the math right. And so you don't want to get, you know, minus three or four points just because you messed up a little bit of the math, right? You, you just go back through and do your calculations one more time and make sure you get this exact answer or an exact answer. Okay, so remember, uh, when you see this word, evaluate, that's a pretty big indicator that this is what's gonna happen. You plug stuff in, calculate. All right. So, now we have a division problem. <clears throat> remember, division is very similar to multiplication. We just have to do one quick thing before we jump into it. Uh, that quick thing is to flip and change the division sign into a multiplication sign. So remember, this comes off of the rule that A over B times C over D, whoops, that shouldn't be a times, hold on, A over B divided by C over D is equal to A over B times D over C. Okay, so that's what we're about to do. So I have my first expression that stays here, x minus one over four x plus eight. Then I change the division sign into a multiplication sign and I flip that last fraction. I have x plus two over two x minus two. Definitely looks like I can factor some stuff out here, so I'm gonna do that on this next step. So I have x minus one and x plus two on top. On the bottom, I had four x plus eight. So I'm gonna rewrite that in a factored form. So I'm gonna pull a four out of that. And then what I have left will be x plus two. Then when it comes to this second one, two x minus two, I'm gonna pull a two out of that one. That's going to leave me with x minus 1. Okay, so now I go through and I cancel everything I can. And I end up with 1 over 4 times 2, which is 8. I like it when that happens. That's a satisfying problem to me. <laughs> Okay, any questions about that one? Not too bad, All right? Flip it, see if you can simplify. Okay, next. 
Um, method one, method two, any preferences? Two? Everybody likes two. Me too. Okay, so let's try this out. So um, method two, remember method two, we list all our denominators on the side, which we don't necessarily need to because I can already see what this is going to be. Our denominators are just x and x squared, and I notice that one of my denominators, x squared, completely contains the factors of the other one. So I don't need to do any more work. That is my LCD. So now I take that LCD and I multiply it through both top and bottom. Okay, so on this next step, I'm going to end up with 10x squared over x, right? And that's just from multiplying into this first term. When I multiply into the second term, I end up with 2x squared over x squared. And then on the bottom, you can see my x squareds just cancel right off the bat. And so I have just a plain old 2 on the bottom. All right, now I go through and I cancel anything that I can. So this x goes away. One of these x's goes away. Both of these go away. And I end up with 10x minus 2 over 2. <clears throat> now I just factor one more time. I see that these top two terms, they do contain a common factor, which is definitely going to cancel with the bottom term. So I factor a 2 out, top, out of the top uh, binomial, and that leaves me with 5x minus 1. And of course, that cancels with my denominator. So 5x minus 1 is my final answer from this. All right. <clears throat> Moving on. Okay. So this one is a rational equation. Remember, when we have fractions and we have an equal sign, we have a special weapon that we get to use against these fractions. And that is we find the LCD and we multiply every term by that LCD and the fractions disappear like magic. <laughs> I'm glad this doesn't catch my hand motions because I don't want that one on the record. Okay, so uh, we, list our LC or we, we list our LCD on the side, um, and honestly, since we, we see that these don't share any common factors, uh, the LCD is just those things multiplied together. So we can say LCD equals 4x. And while we're at it, we might as well restrict a value or two. Well, just one. Well, what should we restrict? Right, what? Yeah? Good. Yeah, right? Yeah, if x equals 0, we're going to break some major rules here. We don't want to do that. So we say x can't be 0. If our solution is x equals 0, we're going to say there are no solutions for this. Okay, so now we have our LCD. We multiply that across both sides. Here on the left side, I end up with 2 times 4x over x, so that gives me 8x over x. On the right side, I have 4 times 5, so that gives me 20x over x. And then when I multiply into the negative 1 fourth, I end up with 4x over 4. Okay, if all your fractions don't cancel on this next step, something went wrong. So we cancel our x's. And we cancel our fours. What we have left is 8 equals 20 minus x. So on this next step, I'm going to go ahead and subtract 20 from both sides. Uh, that's going to give me a negative 12 equals negative x, which tells me x equals 12. So since that was not my restricted value, I'm safe to go ahead and put a box around it and draw a little smiley face next to it. Okay, number nine. 
So, since um, since I am remembering it, let's go ahead and restrict some values real quick. But first, let's let's find the LCD, I guess. Um, so, I'm going to list my denominators on the side. And, and first of all, I'm going to notice this is an equation, so I can use my special weapon and get rid of all the fractions. So I list my two denominators on the side, t minus 3 and t squared minus 9. I give their prime factorizations, which t minus 3 is already done. What does t, minus, uh, what does t squared minus 9 turn into? Good. t plus 3, t minus 3. And that's just based on the difference of squares, special product. Um, so now I just notice real quick that this denominator that we just factored out, this one completely contains the other one. So this one is my LCD. Okay, so now that I know what's in both of the denominators and their factored form, now I need to go back and I need to restrict any values, right? And so I say I need to restrict any values of t that might turn this denominator into zero, and I need to restrict any values of t that might turn this denominator into zero. Yeah, so we gotta say t cannot equal plus or minus three. All right, and so to, you know, to, if you're not sure kind of how that's happening, right, we, we're factoring out the denominators, and I'm saying, I'm taking a hard look at this t right here, and I'm saying, what value would I plug into that t to get a zero for everything, right? That would be t equals negative three. And then I take a hard look at this t, and I say, what value of t would I plug in to get a zero for everything? That's positive t. So those are the two t's that I'm restricting right off the bat. And so that's, that's why we restrict those, is because we might divide by zero, and we want to we wanna get rid of that possibility. We don't want that ever to happen. Okay. Yo, what's up? Sorry. That's all cool. It's all, it's all good. We got, um, hey, we got a video. So. Okay. It, that one we're working on right now, and these two are take-homes for later. You don't have to turn any of them in. Okay. So we just restricted values. We know what our LCD is. So the next step is to multiply every term by that LCD. And I'm going to erase my LCD work down here. OK. So I'm going to try and write it really small up here. So on the side, I have x plus 3, x minus 3. And I do the same thing over here. X plus T, sir. Whoops. <laughs> T minus 3. <laughs> okay. Oh, bummer. Got rid of my work. Well, it's okay. that's okay because I had to rewrite it anyway. <laughs> T plus 3. T minus 3. Good. Plus 3. T minus 3. <laughs> I actually, I can't remember if it was last semester or the semester before. Um, I did one of these problems and I didn't switch one of the variables. So actually in the exam, one of the variables in one of these complex rationals was like an X and everybody was like, you didn't teach us how to do this. <laughs> so I, I had to be like, just pretend it's a T. I'm sorry. Okay. So now that we've multiplied our LCD, let's actually do the math behind that. Um, and when I do this step, I usually I write all this out the long way. If you prefer that, do that. But if you don't necessarily want to write down this full next step, you don't necessarily have to. Um, so I like to write it out the, the long way just so I don't miss anything. So I distribute into this first term, and I have 5 times t plus 3, t minus 3, and that's all over t minus 3. Then I distribute into the second term. And for this one, I don't really need to write it out longhand, actually. Um, remember that t plus 3 and t minus 3 is equal to t squared minus 9. So I'm actually just going to cancel that out. Well, you're right. You're right. Gosh darn it. 
You're right. I, I should do that. I should not skip those because that's where the mistakes happen. How foolish of me. Okay. So, so I'm, I shouldn't skip that step. So I'm going to write it all out. Uh, and I'm also going to factor out the bottom real quick. T plus 3, T minus 3. Okay. And then over here on this far side, I had 1 times all this junk. So uh, that equals to just all that junk. T plus 3 and T minus 3 over here on the right side. So now we go through and we cancel anything that we can. So I cancel my T minus 3s. I cancel my T plus 3s and minus 3s on that one. And there's nothing to cancel over on the far side. So I end up with 5 times T plus 3 minus 30. And it's equal to this stuff, um, which there's no real reason to keep it factored at this point. So I'm just going to rewrite that stuff as a polynomial. T squared minus 9. Okay. <clears throat> so now, now I'm at the point I got rid of all my fractions. And so now I have to take a look at this and figure out what kind of solution I'm looking at. Since I have a squared term on my variable, this is the type of solution that I'm going to have to take everything over to one side, set it equal to zero, and factor. Right? If there were no squared term on this, you'd just you'd put the variables on one side and the numerals on the other. But since there's a squared term, we got to handle this a little bit differently. All right. So first things first, I'm going to get rid of my parentheses over here. So I distribute my 5. That gives me 5t plus 15 minus 30 equals t squared minus 9. Then I just combine my like terms. 15 minus 30, that gives me 5t minus 15 equals t squared minus 9. And then I'm going to start tossing everything over to the right side here. So I'm going to add 15 to both sides. So plus 15 plus 15. That's going to give me 5t equals t squared uh, plus 6. And then I'm going to subtract the 5t over. So I have 0 equals t squared minus 5t plus 6. And we may have already even done a different version of this factorization. So now to solve, all we need to do is factor. Since there's no coefficient out in front of the t, this is the type of, we're multiplying the type of binomials that just have t's as the um, leading terms. And so now we say this is a positive number, right? And since these two numbers must multiply to give us that last number, these either have to both be positive or both be negative. Since these two numbers also have to add to give me this middle number, I know that they m both must be negative, right? Because two positive numbers, they're not going to add to give you a negative result. So I can plug in here negative and negative. So now I say I want. What? What? Um, so 6 minus uh, negative 6 and positive 1 can make a negative 5. Uh, but two positive terms can't make a negative 5. Because this is, um, this is so, so because they both must multiply to give me this, right? The only way to multiply to get a positive term is if both your uh, factors are positive or both are negative. Right? Yeah, and since they have to sum to give me this middle term, right, they both have to be negative, right? Because if they were both positive, you couldn't sum to give me 5. So, so that's, what, that's kind of the logic behind that. So I have P and Q, and I want P times Q to equal 6, P plus Q to equal negative 5. Right, and so I'm sure you guys can see this already, but we're gonna we're gonna fill out the table. Yeah, it is. It's just two and three. <laughs> so I'm gonna say factors of six 
and I put my sums over here, right? Um, one and six, no, that doesn't work, right? Since they're both negative. But two and three, like somebody just said, those will both work if they're both negative. And I, I think after this exam, we're going to start practicing on a little bit tougher factorizations. I don't think I'm doing you guys any favors by always making these kind of like easy enough to where you don't have to fill out a table. Um, you definitely should be used to filling out that table. So yeah, I'm going to step these up a little bit. Um, no, I would say that you, um, hmm. I wouldn't say anything about you, no. <laughs> I'd be too afraid. <laughs> no, no, I just, I don't want you to get um, too used to not having to use this, right? So when you actually do have to find two factors of 166 that differ by 12, you know, it's not quite as easy as, you know, finding two factors of six. Anyway, tangent. So let's go ahead and solve this guy. So now that I have it all factored and equal to zero, I take a look at one of these factors and I say, what would I plug into this variable t to make this whole thing equal to zero? Well, that would be t equals positive two. And what would I plug into t here to make this whole thing equal to zero? t equals three, good. So now I just wanna go up and make sure that I didn't have to restrict any of these values. Boom, alarm bells. <laughs> I do have to restrict one of these values. Boom, this guy is a big old no. No! Uh, this one, however, is still correct. T equals two. <clears throat> and so, just as a little um, tangent from this as well, just because I see I didn't put any examples quite like this in here, if for some reason you reached the bottom and you had factored into something like this, right, and it wasn't so obvious as to what values of x you had to plug in to render all these zeros, you set up an equation, right? And so if I asked you to solve this, you'd say first, you'd say, well, what value of x makes this zero? You might be able to see that, but suppose you couldn't. Then you would set up an equation. You'd say, well, 2x minus 1 equals 0, and now I'm going to solve for x. You'd add 1 to both sides. you get 2x equals, oops, 2x equals 1, and then you divide both sides by 2, and you get x equals 1 half. Right? That's the solution from this factor. This one, you can do the same thing. You'd say 3x plus 10 equals 0. Subtract 10 from both sides, you get 3x equals minus 10. Then you could divide everything by 3. So the solution from this factor would be x equals negative 10 thirds, right? Which is not as easy to see without actually doing the math, right? And so the, the factors that we're looking at at this point are kind of easy factors to evaluate, but sometimes you have to set them up in equation to find out what values of x would make them zero, okay? All right, moving on to number 10. Number 10. Number 10 says, the catch can recreation center pool can be filled in 12 hours if water enters through a pipe alone, or in 30 hours if water enters using a hose alone. If water is entering through both the hose and the pipe, how long will it take to fill the pool? <clears throat> okay, so since we, we have two things, they're both working to complete one job, right? They both have a time that they complete the job alone. This is the work principle. So the basic equation for the work principle is one over A plus one over B equals one over T. Where A is the time for some entity to do the job, B is the time for the next entity to do the job, and T is the time for both of them to do it together. At this level, we, we typically only enter in A and B and solve for T. So 
A would be equal to 12, B would be equal to 30. So I have 1 over 12 plus 1 over 30 equals 1 over T. Now I have an equation with fractions and an equal sign, so I'm going to use my secret weapon. I'm going to find my LCD for these terms. So I list these terms on the side, 12, 30, and t. Then I write out their prime factorizations. 12 is equal to 4 times 3, so that's 2 times 2 times 3. 30 is equal to um, 5 times 6, so that is 5 times 2 times 3. And t is just equal to t. And remember, if you're not sure how to do this step and you can't do it in your head, do factor trees. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to select one of these, which I already have. I write it out front, 5 times 2 times 3, and then I analyze the others for any factors it's missing. So it contains one factor of 2. It contains one factor of 3, but it does not contain two factors of 2. So we need to multiply that in and it also does not contain the t. So our result is 60, 60 t. Okay, so now I need to multiply every single term by 60 t. That'll give me 60t over 12 plus 60t over 30 equals 60t over t. You guys mind if I erase my LCD work? <laughs> I didn't hear any clear yes or no, so I just erased it. <laughs> Alright, so now I'm going to simplify uh, 60 over 12, that's equal to 5, yeah, 5t, and then 60 over 30, that gives me 2t, and then my t's cancel on this far side to get 60. Alright, so now I take a look at this and I say, what kind of solution am I going to have? There are no squared terms, so this is kind of an old-fashioned solution. I put all the variables on one side, the numbers on the other, and just solve it, which is pretty, all, it's pretty much already done. So I combine terms into 7t equals 60, and then I divide both sides by 7, and that gives me 60 over 7, which is roughly what? Is this where you do like the approximate Yeah, this is definitely where you'd want to do that. So I use my little squiggly equals sign. And I say 8.57. To 8.6? Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah. So now we want to go back up and make sure that this makes sense with the original problem. So the original problem said we have a hose and a pipe that we're working with. One fills in 12. The other fills in 30. So yeah, 8.57 hours makes sense according to the problem. If we had an answer like 537, we'd say, uh, no, that's not going to make sense. Or if we had an answer like negative 10, that doesn't make sense either. So this makes sense. So we're going to say, yeah, we're probably correct. OK. <clears throat> Motion. So remember. The basic equation for distance or motion problems is D equals R times T. Distance equals rate times time. So this problem says, Billie Jean Flo and Cooper Colby Consillo are both world famous speed walkers. During a certain race, Billie Jean Flo walks four miles, faster, four miles per hour faster than Cooper Colby Consillo. In the time it takes Cooper Colby Consillo to walk seven and a half miles, Billy Jean Flo walks 13 and a half miles. Yeah. I told you, these are the best. <laughs> we missed the story in our. We don't know that the flow is They are. <laughs> oh. Ours didn't say that. What? Uh, so what does yours say? 
It starts, starts at where really the cool point. walks, yeah. Well, I apologize for robbing you guys. I was lost <laughs> in the story. The experience. Also, yeah. according to your slides, there's a full page. Oh, yeah, don't uh, worry about that. Um, it's a blank slide. <laughs> uh, so sorry about not giving you the context. Um, I've been trying to match these up over the years, and there's inevitably some screw up in it. Um, what would this class be if I didn't screw up it a little bit, guys? Come on. You'd walk out of here thinking something's wrong with the world if Louis didn't mess something up in class. <laughs> yeah, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Right. So it's a distance problem. So. It, some people don't like to do this, but I like to do tables for all my distance problems. Across the top, I just put the formula D, R, and T. On the side, I just put the two people racing, or maybe uh, sometimes it breaks it up in a leg one and leg two. You might put those on the side, but this is two different people. So I'm going to say Billy Jean Flo, BJF, and then Cooper Colby Concillo, C cubed. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> now I fill in as much of this as I can. And, and the way it gets filled in should tell you how to set up the problem. Okay, so I think I already heard somebody reference their speeds, right? It says, Billie Jean Flo walks four miles per hour faster than C cubed. So I can call C cubed four, or sorry, four. I can call it X for his speed and Billie Jean's speed can be x plus 4. Okay, um, right here it tells the distance. It says in the time it takes c cubed to, wa uh, to walk 7.5 miles, right? and so 7.5 is our distance. Billy Jean Flo walks 13.5 miles. Whoops. Okay, so there's one little piece of info in here that's very helpful. In the time, right? Um, so that indicates that it's the same time that they're using, right? In the time that it takes this person to walk 7.5, this person walks 13.5. So the times are equal. Okay, so now we take a look at our table and we see which variable is equal. In this case, it's time. So what we need to do is go back to our original general equation. Distance equals rate times time. And we need to solve this for time. If we divide both sides by r, we see that time is equal to d over r. So. We take the information we have and we fill out a time equation for each of these. Oops, I don't know why my screen keeps slipping around. Uh, so our time equation is always D over R. So I'm going to say Billy Jean flows time D over R. So the D is 13.5. The R is X plus 4. This is equal to capital T time. But capital T time is also equal to C cubed time. So we fill out the equation for his time as well. So his is D over R, which gives us 7.5 over X. Okay, and now on the next step, we just drop the T and set them equal to each other. So we have 13.5 over x plus 4, that is equal now to 7.5 over x. So this is an equation with fractions. So I'm going to create an LCD, multiply through, and clear all those fractions. Uh, since my denominators are already prime, the LCD is just those two denominators multiplied together. All right, so I multiply both sides by that. All 
All right. Now, on the left side, you'll see that the x plus 4s cancel, and I have 13.5 times x remaining. On the right side, the sort of opposite happens. The x's will cancel, and I'll be left with 7.5 times x plus 4 remaining. Now I just need to solve this. So I get 13.5x, and of course I need to get rid of these parentheses before I can solve anything, so I distribute my 7.5 in. That leaves me with 7.5x plus 30. Right. Did I get that one right? <laughs> seven and a half times four? Yeah. Okay, so now I need to subtract the 7.5x from both sides. And that's just so I can consolidate all of my variables over on one side. Oops. Uh, and that leaves me with... Is it 5x? Yeah. 5x equals... 30. Yeah. Divide both sides by 5. Whoops. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> you said 6 and I brain farted. 5 and 5. Okay, good. So you divide both sides by 5 and we end up with x equals 6. Um, <clears throat> you have a question? Is it not? I thought it was five. <laughs> no, you're right. It is six. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. That's what I meant by six. Let's back it up. <laughs> back it up. All right. So notice how I did that part in my head, and that was the part that was wrong. This should be a big warning to you guys. <laughs> be careful about doing stuff in your noggin. It's no good. Don't trust your noggin. <laughs> All right. So that is six. <laughs> Which means, okay, I divide both sides by 6, and I end up with x equals 30 over 6, which is something, 5. I didn't, I was, I'm very unconfident right now. <laughs> All right, so x equals 5. Let's go back up and make sure that makes sense with the problem. So... That would mean that Cooper Colby Cancillo was walking at about 5 miles per hour, and Billie Jean Flo was walking at about 9 miles per hour. Is that really walking? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, but her name is Billie Jean Flo. Average is not her business. <laughs> All right. Let's see if I have anything for 12, and I don't. So. Thank you for your patience today, guys. I'm sorry about the mistakes, and I'm sorry about the lack of context in those problems. Remember, packet number two, the solution set, is available online on video. It's either in the course content section or in the announcements. Packet number three, I'm just going to fill out a simple key for it and leave it outside my office. So do packet number two first, because you'll get the full blah, blah, blah explanation from me online about that. Um, but packet three is just the key, OK? All right, see you guys tomorrow. <laughs>